it, you made opinionated sound like a bad thing in a plenary speaker. Um, hi, thank you very much to you all for being here. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to be here in Brno. And um, it's quite a strange thing if you get to talk in the big room because you get to wear one of these very elegant pieces of headwear which um, you hardly notice at all as you're speaking as I've got it clamped to my temples like some kind of weird torture device. So um, I'm going to be talking about grammar. And if there are any younger teachers in the audience who are wondering about possibly putting in conference proposals in the future, may I recommend including the G word in whatever proposal you put forward? Even if you put in teaching grammar with Lego or, you know, grammar through crystals or whatever you're going to do, um, put grammar in the title and you're guaranteed to get accepted onto the conference circuit and kind of possibly put into a plenary sort of setup because. Grammar does strange things to people, and not only strange things to English language teachers. Uh, I'm sure in the Czech Republic it's probably very similar to the way it is in England, in that concerns about grammar and the way grammar is used in wider society and evidence of grammar being used incorrectly and therefore marking the degradation and imminent collapse of society prevail. Um, if any of you live in the UK, you may be familiar with this man who's in possession of a rather punchable face. Uh, do any of you know this guy? No, count your blessings. Uh, this is a man called Toby Young. And Toby Young's a kind of right-wing social commentator and journalist in the UK. And he's also been a very keen advocate for grammar schools in the UK or um, subsidised private education for middle-class people, as the rest of us call grammar schools. And uh, Toby Young, as well as being a kind of passionate advocate of grammar schools for middle-class school kids, uh, is also the self-appointed creator and awarder of what he's called the annual Bad Grammar Awards. And when I first encountered this idea of the Bad Grammar Awards, obviously, being an English language teacher, I was kind of intrigued as to, in the mind of someone like Toby Young, what might constitute bad grammar. Because, like all of you in the room who are language teachers, I've been exposed to all manner of bad grammar over my 20-plus years of teaching career. And when I first saw the winner of the first annual Bad Grammar Award, one of the things that struck me was what a remarkably articulate and beautiful piece of language it seemed to be. And I was quite surprised that it had been awarded the Bad Grammar Award. So I'm going to show you Toby Young's evil example of bad grammar in action. I should preface it by saying that I'm... Um, in a purely coincidental manner, I'm sure, the example that he chose was actually from an article attacking his support of grammar schools. Uh, can't imagine that there's any connection there, but obviously it just happened to also be an example of appalling grammar. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes with the people next to you just to have a look at this particular example of evil, terrible grammar. And just together, decide what you think is quite so offensive about it. Good luck. Appalling, isn't it? Disgusting. I'll give you a couple of minutes. I can see you're all bursting with ideas there. You can, of course. It was a piece of written text. It was from a, a newspaper article that was written in response to one of Toby Young's pieces. And it's important because we will come back to the idea of grammar and genre as we go on. So, there it is. The worst piece of grammar 
written or spoken in Great Britain last year. And, you know, from a language teaching point of view, you might be looking at this thinking, do you know what, if any of my students produced this, I'd be over the moon. But no, it's terrible. And that, here are some of the reasons why Toby Young finds it so appalling. He doesn't like this thing, little account is taken of blah, 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 that young children need to relate abstract ideas to their experience. And what he doesn't like about this is the fact that the fact that has been elided from this particular sentence. Um, when I read it, I didn't notice this at all, probably like you, I read over it because your brain fills in these elided gaps, which is why the language can be elided in the first place. And, you know, in newspaper articles and that kind of genre of written language, this elision of superfluous conjunctions is actually highly common. Uh, he doesn't like this mixture of singles and plurals, their experience, lives and activity. It should either be singular or plural. You can't mix these things up. And he doesn't like this thing of much of it demands too much, too young. Um, if you have any British people of a certain age in the audience, such as myself, who grew up in the early 1980s, um, there was a really big pop song um, by a group called The Specials called Too Much, Too Young. And uh, Andy Cowell's doing the dance at the back. Look at that. There's a sight. Yes, the, the silent... The silent dance of an aging man recalling his youth. <laughs> Look at that. What a lovely sight. Yeah, have you got the black and white socks? <laughs> and the interesting thing about the song Too Much Too Young was it's uh, you've done too much, too much, too young. Okay? But according to, to, to Toby Young, presumably they mean something like demand too much when children are too young to be ready for so much. That is apparently good grammar. That's much clearer. That's a much better, more beautifully constructed sentence. But as worded, it simply is not English. I'm sure you all felt that when you looked at that initial example of bad grammar. You were probably looking at it going, what is this? It's not English. Because young is an adjective and cannot ever be an adverb. Because English is one of those really fixed languages where words can never change word class. And it just never happens at all. Despite the fact that young is also apparently used as a noun in Toby Young's surname, but presumably that fact escapes him. <laughs> and apparently Chaucer, who some people seem to think was a halfway decent writer of the English language, was also a user of bad grammar. Uh, in this little extract from um, the Canterbury Tales, he that outlives this day and comes safe home, okay? Safe home, you know, safe is an adjective and can never be used as an adverb. Oh, except possibly in Chaucer because, you know, that was a long time ago and anyway, it's a classic. So, there's a strange thing that grammar does to people and... It kind of brings out a lot of people's frenzies and concerns. And I think as language teachers, the way we think about grammar and the way that we present grammar to our students has a huge impact on learning and on the way that students perceive language itself and the way that they perceive learning and what's necessary for them to engage with in terms of learning. Um, as I said, when I first read this, my first thought was, you should be so lucky if that's the worst example of grammar that you've ever encountered. Around the time I, I first encountered Toby Young and his Bad Grammar Award, I was reading a novel by an American novelist called Jonathan Safran Foa. Don't know if any of you have ever heard of him. He's a, a Jewish New Yorker, and he wrote this wonderful first novel called Everything is Illuminated. And it's basically about a Jewish New York American guy whose family had roots in Ukraine and fled Ukraine. And it's about him going back to Ukraine to try to retrace his family roots. And a lot of the most kind of terrifying, horrific details of the story are rendered through the words of his Ukrainian translator, his obviously fictionalized Ukrainian translator. And throughout the book, you get these extracts of letters from his Ukrainian translator. And as I was thinking about Toby Young's Bad Grammar Award, I was reading this novel, and one of the things that really struck me about the letters that the fictionalized Ukrainian translator was sending to the 
fictionalised Jewish New York guy looking to retrace his roots, was how similar they were to a lot of the pieces of writing that my proficiency students will sometimes deliver to me. I don't know how many of you teach proficiency, but uh, if you do, you may well be aware of this phenomenon, whereby students have got the exam, it's a January start, the exam's not until June, they cruise along quite happily, thinking they're doing okay, because they can watch Friends and understand most of it on TV. And about four weeks before the exam, there's you still saying, you're doing okay, but you need to practice your writing. And they say, yeah, 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 yeah. Three weeks before the exam, you're doing well, but you really need to practice your writing. About 10 days before the exam, they suddenly have this kind of panic freak out. And they say, please, Hugh, I've done some writing for you at last. Here it is. Can you correct it? And you look at it and you think, oh my God, <laughs> what do I do with this piece of writing? And a lot of the time, the problem is it's articulately expressed English, but written in a very, very peculiar way. And you have to kind of go through it all and sort of try to break down the way that they think the language works and help them reconstruct it and help them see why the words they've tried to use don't work in that context, don't collocate in that way, don't grammar in that way. And I was thinking about this as I read this wonderful first extract, which I'll give you a minute to read. Okay? Obviously written for comic effect. But there's an interesting point about all of this connected to grammar. I'll give you a minute. It's those proficiency students who've got an online thesaurus. You know, teacher, look how articulate my language is. Yeah, about that. I have always thought of myself as very potent and generative. I bet you have, yeah. Uh-huh. So... When I first read this, what was sort of interesting for me was it reminded me a lot of my sort of Russian students, Arabic-speaking students, who go mad with a thesaurus and want to present themselves as being very erudite and articulate and in possession of a whole wide range of sort of highfalutin synonyms. And part of the problem is that as you're kind of correcting this stuff, the temptation to simply cross the whole thing out, rewrite it, and then say, the problem with your writing was... You don't use the word flaccid like this. You don't use the word dub like this. You don't use the word spleening like this. Here's how you use that word. Here's how you use this word. Then I sort of looked at it and thought, it's interesting because it's obviously a kind of comically ridiculous piece of English, as you can tell from the ripples of laughter around the room. But is it grammatically incorrect? I mean, basically... No, it's basically entirely grammatically correct, apart from possibly there's one past tense somewhere that you could change. Yeah, where is it? Somewhere. Yeah, you know, there's maybe one or two little tiny bits where you want to maybe change the tense. But what makes it wrong, what makes it peculiar, what makes it comic, is nothing to do with grammar. And I think... This is also something that you start to notice as a language teacher, where a lot of the errors that students actually produce exist in this weird grey area where they're not obviously grammatical mistakes, but they're not obviously anything else. Okay? Um, here are some examples that I've heard or seen written from students in the last couple of years. And I think what's interesting about all of them is, are they actually problems with big structural grammar? Or are they problems deploying certain words grammatically correctly or in a kind of patterned way? So when you've got something like, oh, you want to travel a lot, is that a problem with the student never having studied the past simple and not knowing that want is a verb? Or is that a problem of knowing how to use want and how to, gra how to grammar the word want? Um, the same way, you know, he put down me for the problem. The temptation, I think, often as a teacher is to kind of correct the surface grammar and to say, no, it's a separable phrasal verb. He put me down for the problem. 
And then you think, wait a minute, you don't put people down for problems. You criticize people for problems. So what looks like a grammar problem is, in this case, in this instance, actually a kind of phrasal problem or a lexical problem. The old classic, she's been knowing him for a while. Uh, the temptation often, I think, for teachers is to kind of say, oh, we don't use stative verbs in the continuance tense. And then the students will say, what about McDonald's? I'm loving it. What about that song? I've been loving you too long. What about I'm not feeling very well? What, you know, there's a whole list of exceptions. And then as a teacher, you have to kind of say, well, we don't use stative verbs in the continuous form except when we do, which is, which is quite a lot of the time. But, you know, don't worry about that. Just trust me. I'm a teacher, okay? I mean, actually, I think here, it's a problem of knowing how to deploy the word no grammatically. And maybe the only true thing you can say about a sentence like this is, we don't generally use the word no in the present perfect continuous. Next one's interesting, because, you know, you think about things. Yeah, you can think about a policy. You can't rethink about a policy. You just rethink the policy. Why? Because that's how that word works in English usually. Rethink grammars in a different way to the word think. Um, the next one again is another sort of classic. You know, is this a problem with knowing when to use there and when to use its? Or is it a problem with knowing when to use no point ing, which usually goes with theirs? You know, it's a kind of phrasal problem in a sense. Um, the next one was a student describing a picture. And they said, oh, in this picture, they look for shelter because it's storming, okay? You know, because there's a storm, because it's stormy, because there's a storm going on. Why can't I make it into a verb? Well, sometimes you can make nouns into verbs, sometimes you can't. Ask Toby Young, he knows about these kinds of things, I'm not so sure. And I think what's interesting about all of this is there's a kind of very gray area between lexical errors and grammatical errors a lot of the time. And interestingly, a man who's often regarded as a kind of doyen of grammar knowledge and, and grammar teaching, Michael Swan, nails this whole kind of problem very, very acutely. This is what Michael Swan once said. Not that any course book writers ever listened. So Michael Swan himself is basically saying grammar is not one thing, grammar is many, many different things. And it's a stupid idea to try and talk about grammar and approach grammar as if it's always one thing that we can teach in the same way. And yet course book after course book after course book is full of present, practice, produce kind of exercises of grammar. Um, the Raymond Murphy kind of vision of here's the explanation, here's the controlled practice kind of exercises, which has sort of come to dominate English language teaching, still prevails even though people who have spent their whole lives thinking about grammar are sort of shouting from the sidelines saying, wait a minute, it's a bit more complicated than that. So what I want to move on to think about really is if grammar's not one thing, but grammar is a range of different kinds of things, what kinds of different things might grammar be? Okay? And obviously, there's the kind of traditional way of thinking about what grammar might be, the more sort of dominant way in which we've come to think about grammar in English language teaching. So on one level, we can think about grammar as types of words and their functions, you know, young. <laughs> uh, things like up. If you ask most people what's up, they'll tell you it's a preposition. Well, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. It depends. They'll have to up their offer. It's clearly a verb. The whole area is on the up. It's a noun. I was up till three. It's an adverb. You know, he's up in his room. It's part of a prepositional phrase. Up the Arsenal! Do we have any Chelsea supporters in the audience? <sighs> <sighs> Sorry, you missed a glorious weekend of football in London last weekend. And, um, you know, here it's sort of part of an imperative, yeah? So this is one way that we've sort of traditionally been encouraged to think about grammar and to maybe help students notice grammar and process grammar. Um, there's also 
the beloved by people like Toby Young who are trying to hold back the tides of change, rules and forms. Obviously, this includes tenses. You know, they're very clearly part of what grammar is. I think in English language teaching, we've come to see them as pretty much all that grammar is, but they're obviously part of what grammar is. On top of that, you've got all of these kind of rules, you know, the difference between few, a little, a few, a little. I'm sure you've all had fun with that exciting unit in course books over the years. Much, many, a lot of, you know, don't split infinitives, even though they do it on Star Trek. You know, to boldly go where no man has gone before. Wrong! Don't say less, say fewer. And if you see a supermarket using the word less when they should write fewer, write a furious letter to the Daily Telegraph because that will stop it. So there's obviously, you know, this kind of way of thinking about grammar. There are also kind of slots, slots that are very beloved, again, of course books and of grammars that students buy. One of the problems, I think, with the kind of slot approach to grammar is it operates on the assumption that all forms of all possible uses are somehow equal. Um, this is an example that is actually from a real course book at the back, kind of supposedly demonstrating how the tenses work. Okay? You might want to have a quick look at it and think about which ones of those do you think you've ever said? Which ones of those do you think are actual examples of how the language is really used? And this isn't to say that we don't ever use the past continuous passive, or that we don't use, you know, past per, per perfect continuous. We obviously do. But I would suggest not like this. You know, even if you think, I drive cars. I mean, that in itself is a very weird thing to tell someone. What do you do for a living? I drive cars. <laughs> okay. Are you a taxi driver? Just what, chauffeur? What are you? You know, I'm driving cars. Good. How many at once? All at the same. Three hands. I have driven cars. Good. That's very, very nice to know. You know, cars had been being driven. So, you know, again, with grammar, yes, you have these slots and yes, you have these structures that exist. Some examples are much more probable than others. Many, many things are possible. Actually, a very limited number of things are probable. And I think as language teachers, we need to be asking ourselves, is what we're teaching probable or just possible? Because when you're learning a foreign language, you know, your brain space is limited, the time that you have to study is limited. You want to be learning what's probable rather than what's possible. Um, there's also obviously syntax and the position of words within sentences. Often, again, I think, very generically dependent. So, things like this kind of fronting, you know, no account was taken of. Changes in the population of each village that might have occurred since 1873. Little account has been taken of passengers' needs and priorities. This kind of use of fronting is very, very specific to particular genres of written language. And little things like, you know, it's often the little words that are the most tricky to learn in a foreign language. Words like even. Um, I was teaching last year and I had this sentence, I've had a really busy day, I haven't even had time for a coffee. And one of the students asked me, what does even mean? So yeah, it's, it's an impossible question to answer in this kind of context. All you can do is to show other kinds of examples, like, you know, I've been on my feet all day, I haven't even had time for a break. He doesn't drink, doesn't smoke, doesn't even swear. And, you know, you can, all you can do is sort of show it's often used like this in these kinds of contexts. Um, so, there's these kind of syntactical issues and these kind of positional issues that occur within sentences that I think generally most of us would agree are what we think of when we think of grammar. And, of course, there's tenses and there's verb phrases, the kind of traditional ELT canon of, you know, the present simple forms of the verb to be. Units one and two. Elementary, pre-intermediate, and intermediate. The present simple, the past for simple forms of the verb to be. So again, this is often the way we kind of come to think about what students need to learn before they can be exposed to the next big block of grammar that we're going to drop on them from a great height. But I think there are other, more lexical ways of thinking about grammar. And one way that you can think about grammar is as vocabulary or as phrases. 
And in a way, if you think about the very first lesson that you ever do with absolute beginner students, probably the first thing you teach is, what's your name? Okay? Unless you're completely mad, you don't break that down into its constituent grammatical parts. You know, hopefully, you don't kind of go, hi, what's your name? And you tell me your name. And then I say, right, that was an example of a WH question uh, using the verb to be and a you know, second person possessive pronoun and a noun. Because the student's brains just collapse at this point and they can't take this information on. We're quite happy to teach that as an example of a fixed piece of vocabulary that we think has utility. And it's like then we just stop and forget that we were ever able to do this and instead spend the next 60 hours doing mad examples of the present simple where students have to say Maradona is not Brazilian, he is Argentinian. Dracula is not from Brazil, he is Romanian. We are not Argentinian, we are German. And it's like... We just forget that actually you can teach an example of a grammatical structure as a phrase. So, you know, things like, what's it like? Much better just taught as a fixed expression. I've never seen it, but it's supposed to be great. I've never been there, but it's supposed to be great. I've never heard it, but it's supposed to be great. Pfft, I wouldn't bother if I were you. It's a total waste of time. You should have told me. I would have helped you. I would have made you something. I'll do it later. I'll do it tomorrow. You know, I should have finished by five. So I think often students can learn and can be given to learn these kind of very common examples of how grammar is actually realized without necessarily initially studying them as grammar. Uh, my main foreign language is Indonesian, which I found very useful here in Burma. And when I was learning Indonesian, one of the first questions I learned was, which means, how long have you been living here? And it didn't break my brain to hear this after two days of being in Indonesia. I simply asked someone, what does it mean? It means, how long have you been living here? How do I say, only two days? And you say, oh, Juman Duahari. And people go, wow, you know, you can already speak Indonesian. It's like, nope, I can just do this one question, that's it. And I learned that as the most common example of the present perfect continuous in Indonesian way before I ever started doing anything else with the present, con present perfect continuous. And, you know, I get lots of students who've lived in London working for a while. And they can say things like, you know, where are you from? Kurdistan. Have you ever heard my country? Have you ever been my country? And they've kind of they've learned that, have you ever heard, have you ever been, just as a whole chunk. And they know, I can use this chunk to ask you about your experience. So one way we can think about grammar is, you know, as vocabulary, as phrases, as lexis. I think there's also lots of little patterns which are sort of flexible and sort of malleable that we can use in ver varying sorts of ways, but not an infinitely varying number of ways. So, you know, you've got the, um, the old Woody Allen movie, Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About Sex But Were Afraid to Ask. This talk, it's everything you ever wanted to know about grammar, but were afraid to ask. Returning to Star Trek, you know, it's life, Jim, but not as we know it. It's grammar, Jim, but not as we know it. Um, we do this all the time with things from TV and phrases from TV and catchphrases from advertising and, you know, we play with those kind of fixed phrases and adapt them. Um, the number of times I've heard students say things like, because I'm worth it. You know, and it's like they've just learned that whole phrase from the L'Oreal global advertising campaign and sort of play around with it, you know, because you're not worth it. Um, in the same way, you know, things like, what are you doing tonight? What are you doing after this? What are you doing this evening? It's a sort of fixed phrase that can be adapted in a limited number of ways. There's only so many ways you can end that. There's probably five or six really common ways that you end that. And some things look like they should be flexible, look like they should be able to be varied, but aren't. So, you know, take a phrase like, there's no pleasing some people, okay? You might learn that as a fixed phrase. You might think, oh, maybe I can play around with this. Maybe I can change it. Maybe I can say, there's no angering some people. No. Why? Because nobody says that. It's just not a probable sentence of English. You know, basically, it's a fixed expression that looks like you should be able to mess with it, but you can't. So sometimes you can alter the slots. Sometimes you can't alter the slots. 
I think also, if you think about collocation in a broad sense, okay, you think about collocations and collocations of collocations, you start thinking about grammar. Um, if any of you have ever taught Spanish students, uh, lots of Spanish students say things like, I am the responsible of to hire and fire. Because in Spanish, responsible is often used as a noun, the responsible of something. Yeah? In English, it's used as an adjective, and it collocates differently. So you get things like, I'm responsible for hiring and firing, responsible for corporate and social responsibility, responsible for taking minutes at meetings. You then put the noun, responsibility, you get completely different grammar that goes with the noun. So the adjective form and the noun form grammar in different ways, or pattern grammatically in different ways. You go back to the you know, negative adjective form, again, it patterns differently. It has its own internal grammar. And I think this idea of thinking about the grammar of individual words gives you a very different way of thinking about what grammar is and how grammar works. Instead of the kind of big top-down grammar, which we just drop words into, as Chomsky suggested, instead it's thinking about the individual words that drive our communication and the grammatical patterns which often attach themselves to those particular words. There's also colligation. Can I just ask, how many of you know this concept of colligation? Oh, this is your fancy new word to take away for the day to impress your friend. Up into a conference, you know, what did you learn? I learned what colligation was. What's that? I'm not going to tell you. Yeah. Uh, colligation is basically the grammatical patterns which frequently attach themselves to words. It's like kind of grammatical collocation, if you like. So if you think of, you know, the verb to be born, okay? Sometimes my students have asked me, what's the active form? You know, can I say, my mother borned me? No. Why? Why can't you make this active? It's like, well, born is basically, it only colligates with generally the past perfect, the past passive, it's past simple passive. You know, I guess you can also have hundreds of children have been born as a present perfect passive. But basically it colligates with the passive. In the same way, something like dub, you know, the most frequent colligation of dub is past simple passive. So, you know, Bandung was once dubbed the Paris of the East. Earmarked. One of the features of the word earmarked is it's almost always passive. So, you know, the building has been earmarked for demolition. Someone's decided that one, knock it down. And again, you look at phrases, they colligate in weird ways. So, you know, I can't be bothered. Very common. What's the positive form of this? Can I say I can be bothered? No. Why? Because that's how bothered colligates. It just patterns in that way and not in this way. It was really surprising. It wasn't that surprising. Okay, both of those work. It was quite astonishing. It was not that astonishing. Sounds a bit weird because ungradable or extreme adjectives generally don't colligate with not that. So again, it's sort of thinking about bottom-up grammar and thinking about the grammar of individual words that you're teaching and making those grammatical patterns available to your students. There's also just patterns, okay? So little things like just because it doesn't mean, okay? Um, it looks like a kind of fixed phrase, but it's very, very flexible. So, you know, just because I'm a teacher doesn't mean I've failed at everything else. Yeah, you tell yourself that. Just because I'm a man, it doesn't mean I can't cook. You know, just because I'm English, it doesn't mean I'm an alcoholic football hooligan. Um, a little quote from the specials who I referred to earlier. Just because you're a black boy, just because you're a white, doesn't mean you've got to hate him, doesn't mean you've got to fight. There's also this idea that I encountered through a linguist called Nick Ellis, which is that a lot of the time, the way we can guess the meaning of new words is because we've learned prototypical examples of a pattern that the new word is encapsulated within. So if you look at verb across a place, okay, almost always the most common verb that goes into that pattern is go. So, you know, you go across a place. Every other example that you encounter of across a place is almost certainly going to be some kind of variation of go. So, you know, you can go across a place, move across a place, travel across a place. If you then see a sentence which said, 
They man doubled across the place. You probably look at this and go, I don't know what man doubled means, but it's some kind of way of moving. How do you know that? Well, because you know that travel, move, go across a place is the most common way in which this pattern is filled. Okay? So there are these kind of patterns which are sort of grammar. Again, there's also all kinds of discourse patterns, which I think fall under a sort of broad grammar heading, if you want a liberal definition of grammar. Um, when I was at school, I can remember being told when I had to start writing argumentative essays, if you're stuck for an argumentative essay, here's an engine for creating them. The best thing you do is you say, while some people believe blah, 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 it nevertheless seems true that blah, 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 blah. If you're going to do a plenary talk or a conference talk using grammar, just use that. You know, whilst Raymond Murphy has often said blah, 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 actually it seems true that blah, 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 blah. There you go, you can spin that out for a whole hour. Um, things like according to, however, in reality. Very common in letters of complaint or emails of complaint. You know, according to your website, the rooms were supposed to come with ensuite bathrooms. However, in reality, you know, we had to pee out of the hotel window. Um, you've also got sort of discourse patterns of conversation. Um, I've often said that when you're interviewing students, one of the ways you can tell the level is by just asking three basic questions. First question, where are you from? If the students start panicking and saying, I am from, no, I come from, no, I am come from Brazil, you're already starting to think probably pre-intermediate. Um, if they say, yeah, I'm from a small town up in the north of Sweden called uh, Ulya. Uh, you probably haven't heard of it. It's only got a population of 100. You're in the proficiency class. Thank you. Interview finished. Okay. The next question you ask is whereabouts. And most students don't learn this question or don't learn the answer to this question. Because when they learn where are you from, they're doing it in unit two of their elementary course book. And actually what they're learning is where are you from? I am not from Brazil. I am from England. Did I ask you where you're not from? Okay? What they don't learn is whereabouts, because it doesn't fit that kind of let's practice the present simple forms of the verb to be until we're all sick of it. In conversation, that's the obvious next question that you'll ask. That's just part of the discourse of that conversation. And possibly the next question is, and are you from there originally? No, actually, I was born here and I moved there when I was 18 to go to university. So, you know... It's a kind of grammar. It's discoursal patterns which have familiar grammatical realizations within written language or within spoken language. And finally, just to kind of go back to this thing about where's it from, there's genre dependence. So, you know, things like texting, notes, informal conversations, blah, blah, blah. They all have their own kind of conventions, and this includes grammatical and lexico-grammatical conventions. For example, you know, a feature of newspaper articles and letters to newspapers is this kind of removal of unnecessary words of the kind that Toby Young finds so offensive. Ironically, he seems unaware of the fact that genres have these kind of grammatical conventions. So, what does all this mean for us in the classroom? Okay, I think one thing it obviously means is not everything is amenable to being PPP'd to use a noun as a verb, okay? Um, not everything can be presented, practiced, and produced. As a course book writer myself, you know, it drives me mad when I'm trying to write something on, say, non-defining relative clauses, and they say, we need a productive context in which students can practice this in speaking. It's like, it's, just, it's, it's madness, because basically students need to know it, they need to see it exists, they probably need to practice using it, there is no one sane conversational practice which will allow you to produce 42 examples of non-defining relative clauses in speech. It just doesn't work like that. I think what we need to accept is, firstly, the road is long. Nobody likes to hear this. Students don't like to be told this. But it's the reality of learning a language or of actually learning anything to any degree of competence. You know, competence basically clearly isn't just learned by studying grammar forms and studying grammar meanings. I think instead, you learn competence slowly. It develops slowly. You might be able to use certain examples of a particular structure competently, but not others yet. You learn language from language. You learn language from input. 
You generally learn better from whole sentences. You generally learn better from discourse. I think students need to see the new vocabulary or the new lexis that we're expecting them to learn with the grammar that that vocabulary is often used with. And rather than, I drive cars, cars have been being driven, they need to see grammar with the lexis it's often used with. So we need to kind of think about bridging this gap between this is a grammar lesson, this is a vocabulary lesson. And I think instead, just thinking this is a language lesson, where we're learning this grammar in this context with this vocabulary, we're learning this vocabulary in this context with this grammar. We need to think about how the input we give students conditions them or primes them and helps them to expect the language to work in normal kinds of ways. We need to encourage noticing. And as Stephen's going to talk about later, I think, you know, we really need to be encouraging reading, extensive reading, because I think it's often through the reading a lot of this stuff starts to crystallise in students' minds. I think there are other things that may help students, you know, I hedge that. One thing may be explanations and learning rules. I think particularly early on when you're starting out as a language learner, you know, possibly having a basic explanation, having a basic rule is obviously a useful kind of thing. I think we need to be very aware of the limitations and we need to be aware of the bad rules. So personally, I think things like, you know, we don't use stative verbs in the continuous tense, it, it's a bad rule because it's so obviously not true or there's so many exceptions. Maybe a better rule in that context is we don't use the verb no in the present perfect continuous. You know, so you can still give generalizations or you can still give basic truths about the language. And I think that can obviously be very helpful to, to kind of low-level learners. I think we need to be very conscious of context. I think eliciting language is a very useful thing. I think this whole idea of PPP, presenting, practicing, producing, it can also be used in a sort of slightly varied way for chunks of language and also for whole kinds of conversations. You can present and encourage students to build up dialogues through a PPP model. If any of you have ever done kind of dialogue building with low-level students, even if you're just doing something like, what are you doing tonight? I'm going to the cinema. Oh, what are you going to see? You know, Wonder Woman. What are you doing tonight? I'm going to my yoga class. Oh, where do you do that? In the yoga center. You know, even if that's all you're doing and you're just presenting a kind of fixed, well, a flexible but not infinitely flexible little conversation, that can be done through PPP. The same way chunks like, sorry, I'm in a rush. You know, you can present, hey, how are you? I haven't seen you for ages. I know. Let's go and have a coffee. Sorry, I'm in a rush. Okay, maybe some other time. You can present that little exchange and practice that little exchange as a kind of PPP model. I think noticing is obviously a very important aspect of language learning. And just encouraging students, yeah, in Spanish, responsible, you use it as a noun. Look, here, in English, you use it as an adjective. So you say, I'm responsible for. After the for, you've got the ing. And I think it's getting into the habit as a teacher of doing that kind of thing all the time. Just constantly drawing their attention to, yeah, you've got the ing here because of the preposition. Here you've got expected, so it's expected to, you know, be changed next year. You need to have the to because you've got the expected. Um, and it might also be you're doing a vocabulary exercise, but part of what you then also do is just to say, yeah, what tense is this sentence here? That's right, present perfect. Why? from the past to now. Good, just checking. Where you're doing lots of this kind of thing on a regular basis, I think that's more effective, this kind of slow drip, distributed sort of awareness raising and encouraging of noticing than doing one great big block of grammar and assuming students have got that. I think any kind of misguided, guided discovery or inductive learning can be useful where often you're kind of giving the students the examples, you're getting them to think about the rules, maybe you guide them towards the creation of those rules through the questions that you ask them, can be useful. Um, something I think Philip will be talking about later is a two-way translation. I don't know how many of you were told, you know, never use Czech in your classrooms, your students must think in English. <laughs> Good luck with that. 
Yeah, I mean, students don't think in English because they're not English, because they're Czech, so they're probably thinking in Czech most of the time. Um, when I'm learning Indonesian now, I'm always, still, I'm sort of an advanced speaker of the language. When I'm thinking of how to say things I don't know, I relate it to English, because that's what I have to express myself. I think two-way translation works really well if you're translating whole sentences. So if you take something like, I haven't seen you for ages, um, a lot of my French students, they can easily translate that back into French because the meaning's pretty clear. If you then, a week later, show them the French and say, tell me the English, they'll often say something like, it is a long time since I didn't see you. Okay? Because they'll do a kind of direct word-for-word -word translation back. And I think that's one of the fundamental problems students have. They see something in English, they understand it, they can translate it into Czech or French or whatever their mother tongue is. When they then come to re-express that idea, they translate it directly from L1. So if you're doing two-way translation, and I guess Philip might talk about this a bit more detail later. No. There you go, sorry. You can't get the staff anymore. Um, I think this idea of kind of giving students sentences or phrases or expressions, getting them to translate into their mother tongue, keeping that, a week later coming back to the mother tongue, getting them to translate not word for word, but whole phrase level back into English. It's a way of catching that kind of you know, gap that exists between what they can understand receptively and what they can produce themselves. I think close exercises are great particularly when you're looking at little bits of language that don't fall into the kind of mainstream canon of ELT. So if you've got something like, mm, no point calling him at this time of night, he mm, be in. You know, that allows you to look at things like, there's no point, won't be in. And it allows you to kind of explore those bitty bits of language that otherwise don't often get covered. Um, any kind of gap fill, choose the best form, transformation exercises where you're focusing them on kind of the, the, the little bitty differences between phrases. So things like, you know, I'd rather not prefer. I'd prefer not to. Yeah? Do you want to go out tonight? Do you fancy going out tonight? Where you're raising their awareness of basically expressing the same meaning, grammar in different kinds of ways. Um, I'm a big fan of drills, particularly where you're drilling things that are often said and that have little kind of lexical variations and you're learning the whole kind of phonological envelope that they come in. So if you're doing things like, how long have you been living here? Everyone, how long have you been living here? How long have you been working there? How long have you been working there? How long have you been doing that? It kind of keeps students on their toes because they don't quite know which one's coming next. It's the same kind of phonological envelope each time. It helps the students get their tongues around it. It helps them hear it better next time they hear it. And it just sort of allows that, that motor skill practice of something that they might need to say themselves. And I think a lot of the time, teaching in this kind of you know unplugged way where you're working from the students and you're listening to them and you're saying, yeah, okay, what do you mean? Do you mean this or do you mean this? Oh, you mean this, right, so you need to say it in this way. Where you're kind of negotiating the meaning with students and from that negotiation, you're clarifying what particular language the students need to do. That, I think, is also very useful. Just a couple of final thoughts. Um, a note of caution, I think. Kind of connected to this idea of English as it's used outside of native speaker contexts. Also, I guess, connected to the idea of level and connected to the idea of interlanguage. Because I think, you know, when you're thinking about whether you want to call it elf or whether you want to call it level or whether you want to call it interlanguage, whichever one of those you go for, there's a real issue in thinking about what is correct grammar at a particular level, you know, and what grammar is problematic at a particular level. Basically, it's very rarely grammar that causes problems in communication between students. Um, the main problematic area is either going to be lexical, phrasal, or sometimes phonological. And I think sometimes maybe we obsess and we worry about the wrong thing. So if you're teaching your elementary students and you're going home and bashing your head against the wall saying, they still don't use the third person S, that's because they're elementary students. You know, if they're in your proficiency class, possibly a bit of a problem.
Okay? If they're in your elementary class, they're in the right class because they can't use the third person S yet. You can tell them as many times as you want. You can correct that as many times as you want. That will happen when it's ready to happen. Um, I've got a five-year-old son at home, and he's my own son, by the way, I should say. Not someone else's that I keep in a cupboard or something. And um, it's interesting watching his kind of language development, because even now at five, the way he marks the past tense is he sticks did in front of everything. So he says, we did go there yesterday, didn't we, Daddy? We did see that, we did watch that. And, you know, you can paraphrase it and go, yeah, we went there last week, didn't we? Yeah, we saw that on Saturday. Yeah, five years I've been doing this, and has it changed his grammar? Not yet. You know, and at some point, I assume that will stop happening, and he'll, I hope, I'd be a bit weird otherwise. <laughs> but basically, that will happen when it's ready to happen. And there's no point worrying about it. There's no point kind of beating, I must be a bad parent, I'm a language teacher who can't even teach his son to use the past tense correctly. You know, I'm an English teacher who can't teach my elementary students to use the third person S. My pre-intermediate students still make mistakes with the present perfect. No, really? God. You know, chill. Just relax. It will happen in due time. Finally, some advice from an ex-poet laureate. Uh, I don't know how many of you know the poet la ex-poet laureate called um, Philip Larkin. He was a poet from Hull. And uh, he wrote a very famous poem called This Be The Verse, which was about how your parents fuck you up. And uh, they don't mean to, but they do. And they give you all of their faults. But, you know, they give you some extra faults just for you. And um, in tribute to the idea of taking holes or taking frames and being able to play with them and break them down and readapt them, which for me is this kind of at the heart of the idea of thinking about grammar from a lexical point of view. I wanted to finish with apologies to Philip Larkin with a, a little poem to give you some advice about your own feelings about grammar teaching. They fuck you up, your language teachers. They don't mean to, but they do. They plague you with their rules of grammar. With extra homework from Raymond Murphy's English Grammar in Use, probably photocopied, just for you. But they were fucked up in their turn by fools in old-style hats and coats who half the time had games and fun and half Murphyed you round the throat. Murphy is a noun and must never be used as a verb. Man hands on misery to man and woman to woman and man to woman and woman to man. It deepens like a coastal shelf. Get out as early as you can. And don't obsess about grammar yourself. Thank you very much.